Hi, everyone, and warm welcome to another session in our educational webinar series. My name is Farnoosh, I'm the Head of Education, and I'm very glad to be hosting today's session on integrating multisensory models of brain or mind with naturalistic laboratory research to improve uh, pediatric research. Our presenter today is Dr. Paul Matus, uh, who is the group leader at the School of Applied Sciences of Western Switzerland and University Hospital Center, University of Lausanne. And uh, he holds an adjunct professor appointment at the hearing in the speech department at uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville, USA. Uh, Paul is an experimental psychologist and uh, cognitive neuroscientist who is interested in how adults and children process information in naturalistic multisensory environments. The session will be followed by a practical part by Dr. Uh, Roman uh, um, Bachrushet, uh, who is also a cognitive neuroscientist and currently working as an application specialist at AMT Neuro. Uh, this time, uh, the demo uh, presentation will be a bit different. It will walk us through the steps of pre processing uh, EEG data acquired with EEGO system in EEG Lab platform. He actually used his MATLAB license to record a video with all the details as he couldn't uh, attend uh, the session today due to a uh, uh, coinciding uh, trip. Uh, however, um, we will have Dr. Antonia Tellen as the head of scientific support in the Q&A panel in case any questions arise from the technology side. If you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please feel free to write them in the questions chat box and we will make sure to cover them mm -hmm. during the Q&A as far as the timing allows. Also, there will be some poll questions, uh, like always, uh, and they seek your um, active participation and the results will be shown live. So, Paul, uh, we are very excited to have you here today. Thanks again for accepting to give this webinar in the midst of summertime and the screen and the stage is yours. We are looking forward. Perfect. Thank you, Farnoosh. Uh, one second, I'm just gonna move some stuff. <clears throat> uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you to the team of INT Nebro for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I arrived to Lausanne approximately 10 years ago where I did my work at the University of Hospital Center. Um, then I moved to the University of uh, Applied Sciences in Western Switzerland, where I reside between Sion and Sierre. Um, um, a lot of the work I'm going to show you today has been done at the University Hospital Center. Here, thanks uh, especially to uh, Mike Amori, with whom uh, most of this work has been done, but also the work I'll present today has been developed at Oxford University and also Bagwick College London. So thanks to those people, as well as to my collaborators and the funders as well as to, uh, to the people who are in my group right now, here are in CF, the group of World Neuroscience, Mary, Christina, and Alex. Um, so to me, um, development is, uh, is about learning, and learning is, in my opinion, a fight against destruction. So when we think about the classroom, we should be thinking about something like this. But in my understanding, destruction is somewhat different than to what people usually portray it as. So to me, Many of the visual distractors are typically accompanied by sounds, by touch stimuli, or if we're less lucky, by smell or taste stimuli. So our real-world learning environments are cluttered and multisensory in nature. So most of my work has focused on understanding how learning deals with destruction in order to uh, in order to uh, sorry how the brain deals with destruction in order to support learning. So there are many approaches to, to, um, uh, to discover uh, how this actually works. There's the classic laboratory research. So we put people in scanners, we put EEG caps on them in the laboratory, we present single stimuli on the screen for them and ask them questions about it. So these approaches are, this approach is very good because it has proven fruitful in testing highly detailed hypotheses about the brain function organization and cognition, but it offers a simplified model for naturalistic perception and action. We have high stimulus and environmental control, but typically this comes at the expense of naturalness. However, what is this approach good for is that we can tease apart the neural mechanisms um, that are responsible for processing discrete isolated task aspects, typically in different senses. 
On the other hand, on the other extreme, we have the so-called naturalistic real-world research has been uh, very popular uh, these days. And you also have summer school organized by NT that uh, deals with some of those issues where we put EEG caps and other neuroimaging um, tools on people in their um, regular environments. We still put people in, in, uh, in scanners, but instead of simple stimuli, we offer them a story or a movie. And this approach is great because it offers us close to maximal naturalness, but often at the expense of control over the stimulation and the environment. It's great because it allows us to directly test those um, hypotheses which have been developed in the lab in environments where we actually um, process information and behave. What is good for also is that it can reveal novel factors and mechanisms that then can be again scrutinized in the laboratory. And together with uh, at some colleagues uh, recently we have proposed, we have put those two approaches in a sort of uh, three-stage uh, cycle and offered um, another approach as a bridge between the two. Uh, and this is called the naturalistic laboratory research, which offers a close approximation of natural perception and action. Um, while it gives us still certain level of stimulus control, it helps us to probe mechanisms that give rise to the neurocognitive functions in more dynamic and complex settings. And also, allows us to test those piecemeal predictions developed in the laboratory by emulating the variabilities that are present in real world environments, such as in the classroom. Right, so in my work, I integrate experimental psychology, neuroscience, neuroimaging, and technology. And each of those offers um, knowledge base. And based on this knowledge base, we can, I ask myself um, different questions. For example, what cognitive processes support learning? How does the brain learn and represent information? How is measuring brain activity and structure useful to understand and support learning? And finally, how does technology at large can support learning as well? So to start with neuroscience, how does the brain uh, naturally represent uh, information in the uh, uh, natural information, sorry. So um, in our, uh, uh, one of the seminal studies um, in this area is the study by May on 2009, where the researchers have presented pictures of naturalistic objects to sighted individuals. And without surprise, they have demonstrated extensive uh, occipital activations. What they also did, they also uh, taken a group of consciously blind people and they presented to them the sounds that represent those um, naturalistic object categories. And they have found very similar extensive um, activations. And um, what this shows us is that the brain has a natural tendency to represent objects and their properties in a sort of a modal or multisensory um, fashion, engaging very similar areas. In contrast, in, in addition, what we also um, have been seeing is that the brain has a natural tendency to integrate information across the senses. So in the work uh, by Professor Michael Murray, um, um, uh, it's been shown that the brain integrates audiovisual information within the first 100 milliseconds. And this shows us how early our brain is already ready to, uh, to extract the redundancies that exist in multisensory stimuli. So um, as multisensory nature of stimuli does alter information processing, for the past 10 years, I've been investigating together with my colleagues when and where many multisensory processes engage the brain, um, what type of multiple processes are engaged by multisensory stimuli, and more recently, how do multisensory processes influence the development and learning and naturalistic contexts. So do multisensory processes develop too? Yes, definitely. Um, um, researchers have proposed um, a theoretical framework according to which as we age, um, we rely more on multisensory processes that are based on created learned associations in the environment and task contingencies, and less on multisensory processes that are dependent on physical stimulus characteristics. So to summarize knowledge here, objects representations are naturally multisensory. Multisensory processes alter brain responses, but also they develop. Moving on to the um, brain measures. To study development, you should use measures that are cost-effective and information-rich. So time for poll two. As I ask my colleague to raise the poll, please. Yeah. 
Yeah, the poll is ongoing and you have 30 seconds to respond. What is EEG? Okay, 87% uh, or more than 90% voted already. So uh, we will close the poll and share the results. So good temporal information, but bad spatial information um, is uh, selected by the majority, 71% of the people. And 29% went for good temporal information, but also good spatial information. I think they are the ones in favor of more topographic uh, uh, source imaging uh, sort of analysis. Do you agree with that, Paul? Um, yeah, I think that's a that's an unsurprising uh, response. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope I'll convince you to uh, at the end of this talk to, to be more towards the uh, the second most uh, favorite response. Okay. So, um, in my research, I use EEG. Why is that? Well. EEG is cost effective, it's portable, it's easy to use, also in the clinical settings and for developmental populations, has high temporal resolution, that's definitely agreed on. And it's very accessible across the lifespan and can be easily combined with other techniques and measures. And finally, it offers independence of over behavioral response. And the all of those aspects actually are very useful uh, when we're doing developmental research. So for example, Accessibility across lifespan allows us to establish whether nine-year-olds have developed a certain cognitive process, but it's just slower than in the adults. Or maybe this uh, the same cognitive process is operating via different mechanisms, brain mechanisms altogether. In turn, the independence of over-behavioral responses can allow us to assess whether the same cognitive process has been engaged in the lab as in the classroom. But also, if children haven't made um, the right response, we can check whether this is um, due to them not engaging a given cognitive process. I'll explain this to you in just a second. Right, so EEG, why EEG? Because EEG offers us well understood um, brain markers among others of selective attention. Just to um, be clear, selective attention is our ability or it's, a, it's an umbrella term for all of those neurocognitive processes that allow us to focus on the currently important objects and, and events and uh, not pay attention to those things that are currently not important to our goals. So for selective attention, this marker is the so-called MTPC component. And imagine yourself uh, seeing this screen, an area of, of stimuli, and if we show that to participants, um, then uh, uh, and we tell participants to pay to, to this pay attention to this white uh, rectangle, then around 200 milliseconds after the presentation of this array there will be a more negative response on the other side than the side of the target of the uh, of the of the hemiscalp uh, over its posterior sides then on the same side of the hemiscalp as the side of the stimulus and we believe that this represents um, a brain response related to attention selection of visual target of visual target objects um, it is believed to be generated in vision specific areas but uh, like posterior parietal uh, uh, cortex and natural occipital cortex, but to me that's under debate. Um, what is more important is whether NTPC is a viable marker of selective attention in the real world. So my work has demonstrated that NTPC is sensitive to all the visual process, but mainly based. We don't have a very good understanding of its sensitivity to audiovisual distractors or where when it emerges in development or whether it's robust against early sensory experiments. So um, there's certainly an um, added value of high-density EEG, which is our know, ability to use the so-called electron neuroimaging approach. So this approach has been um, developed here in Switzerland in the 1980s. And what does it consist of? Well, typically, um, its, its benefits are visible when we use um, high-density caps, more than 54 electrodes, but also we can get um, pretty okay results, even with eight electrodes, as been shown. 
What it does, it focuses on robust global features of the scalp EEG, and also it offers independent measures of both strength and network-based brain mechanisms. So what is electroneon imaging? Well, electroneon imaging um, focuses on, on one feature, uh, or one important feature of the scalp EEG, and this is topography. And ARP topography is like the topography of the mountains, meaning mm, the mountain shape is independent of the um, meters above the sea level uh, distance. Uh, and in the same vein, ERP topography is independent of the uh, a reference electrode. So if we have a simple uh, visual perception paradigm, you can see here um, that um, the values of different electrodes would change um, strongly uh, depending on the type of, uh, on the type of, um, sorry, on the type of, um, just let me show this. Um, ba -ba -ba. Here, that the, the values would have changed in amplitude quite a lot. However, what doesn't change is the structure of the electrical field at the scalp. Okay. okay. Do I need to switch it off? Uh, right. So, Electron imaging also offers us quite a lot of benefits um, in understanding species selective uh, brain responses like those that are typically associated with attention. So if you think about the N2PC, N2PC is a difference in the local electrical field, meaning it assumes that only the difference between two points of lateral brain activity is relevant for the selective attention. What this also means is that lateral gradients and non-lateralized activity is generally ignored and supposed to not be important for selective attention. In contrast, measures of global electrical field, so across the whole scalp, can quantify both lateralized and non-lateralized activity gradients, where measures such as global field power can um, capture the modulations in EEG response strength and global dissimilarity EEG response topography. We have also shown that when we measure the activity during um, paying attention, um, uh, the EEG and behavioral measures have a much better uh, correspondence. So if we, uh, for example, look at the correlations between um, change between two behavior, uh, in, in behavioral measures between two attentional conditions and then to be seen in amplitude, so a traditional measure of, of, uh, of attention, there's no correlation. However, when we measure GFP across the NTPC time window, um, there's a very high correlation. So to summarize this, uh, this part, EEG does offer us complementary insights into cognitive processes and their dynamics. And this is likely useful also for um, uh, different populations and uh, including age populations. Next, what cognitive processes support learning? This is time for poll three. Paul is ongoing. All right, I closed the poll and we have some interesting results. Actually, 85% of the people went for uh, option uh, four. It depends on the snack and type of distractor around. Then 8% uh, um, number one and 8% number two. Is that what you were looking for? Which responses were those? The one and two? Sorry, I don't have the, the, the questions. <laughs> oh, a squirrel. Um, <laughs> and, uh, does paying attention to the target uh, come with a snack? Perfect. Okay, so, equal, equal, yeah, equal that's great. Yeah. Uh, very well done, uh, everyone. So indeed, uh, based on what we uh, what we know about the, uh, the brain of the kids, they are very much dependent on external um, gratification, but indeed also their ability to pay attention and be 
um, similar or different to adults will also depend on the type of um, the 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 the, uh, the destructor setting or the the types of destructor that are um, engaging one or the other sense. Correct. Okay. Right. So. Um, what we do know is that our ability to pay attention is important for learning. And this is a well-established finding. What we do not understand very well is to what extent um, multisensory integration and selective attention do interact to support or, or hamper learning. But uh, some of my work that I've been doing over the past 10 years has been focusing on answering this question in a sort of a piecemeal um, fashion. So um, at Berber College with Martin Imer, we have demonstrated that visual objects have ability to capture attention more strongly when accompanied by sounds, even during a, a very demanding visual task. But on the other hand, with Gaia Sheriff and Oxford, we have also shown that children's limited selective attention skills do shield them from multisensory distraction in contrast to adults when the task is demanding. So the story is definitely not as clear cut as uh, we would uh, be able to think based on visual literature. And finally, with Michael Murray, we have demonstrated also with Antonia, who's present here, we've demonstrated that multisensory processes improve our object uh, memory, whether this is visual objects or auditory objects, independently of observers, observers' intention, which shows us the, the strength of uh, multisensory processes in, in supporting and, and shaping learning and attention. Right, so based on all of this uh, data, we have asked ourselves, um, how does multisensory attention shape the acquisition of basic educational skills vis-a-vis -vis children's experience? So together with my former PhD student, Nora Turoman, we have tested quite a few participants. So five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, nine-year-olds, and young adult controls. And the task was following. So um, kids and adults were supposed to help Captain Blackbeard to um, collect real from among fake diamonds so they would be looking for for example a blue diamond and then just pressing a button to judge its orientation vertical or horizontal and on every trial there would be a cue there would be a spatially and informative color change um, that would either match the target color or not match such as as we have it demonstrated here but also on 50 percent of trials those um, cue, color cues would be either presented alone or presented together with tones and those tones would be completely irrelevant to the task of searching for diamonds but also spatially viewed so they would offer no information about the likely location of the target diamonds and of course we recorded eeg and today i'll only talk about the results from two younger groups um, just to save up a little bit on time right so our measures were extensive so we based the behavioral measures on spatial queuing effects here measuring attentional capture, which are basically just faster reaction times when the queue and target share location as opposed to not. And based on this, we have uh, an established measure of the strength of visual selective attention, the so-called task set contingent capture, which shows that um, those um, distractors that share the color of the target capture attention while those that don't, um, do not. Uh, finally, you also, based on, on my work, we have also designed a uh, multisensory attention measure, multisensory enhancement of attentional capture, which basically demonstrates um, that those distractors that are larger, uh, sorry, that are audiovisual capture visual attention more strongly than those distractors that are just purely visual. For ERP analysis, we use the N2PC and also electrical neuroimaging, we combine the two. And here we focused um, from our multivariate analysis on data driven grouping, so clustering of our ERPs. And finally, we also added neuropsych. Um, testing of IQ and the standardized test of literacy and numeracy uh, achievements for each of um, the age groups. Right, so for adults, what have we found? We weren't very surprised. So we have um, found the tacit contingent capture, which shows the strength of uh, visual selective attention. This is a well um, demonstrated finding. We were not, um, uh, we are happy to, to uh, replicate this. We also replicated our, uh, our previous work uh, to the sensitivity of adults to the uh, multisensory nature of the destructors, meaning that capture was stronger on those trials where the visual destructors were accompanied by sounds. What about kids? Well, for seven-year-olds, we have uh, interestingly also found that they had um, magnitude-wise very similar attentional capture to adults. 
just after two years of schooling. However, there was no further modulation of capture by the presence of sounds, meaning that at least seven-year-old do not have yet the ability for or, or the propensity for involuntary multisensory enhancement of visual attention. What about five-year-olds? Well, as expected, the data was highly variable, but what have we found in terms of reliable findings? Actually, there was attentional capture, um, but this attentional capture in our five-year-olds, uh, it's not surprising these kids are very young, and in fact, they just start slowly a sort of formal schooling in Switzerland. So they had attentional capture. That's great. That's interesting. It's not a it's not a regular finding uh, to 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 find uh, ability for spatial attention, even guided exogenously in, in such conditions in this age group. But this uh, attentional capture was not yet modulated um, by the color of the distractor or by its uh, by the number of senses it engaged. Right. In terms of N2PC, what did we find in adults? We have replicated the regular finding that N2PC is elicited by, by color distractors, and also that it was modulated by visual selective attention. This has, we have found this before. This is a well-established finding. What about audiovisual settings? Well, in fact, the N2PC uh, in its traditional way of analysis was not sensitive to whether the distractors were paired with sounds or not. Which is a little bit uh, a little bit um, confusing because we did find a behavioral um, a behavioral effect uh, in in that uh, in that direction. What about seven year olds? Seven year olds did not show any adult like NTPCs, and five year olds also not. Which again goes uh, goes against the behavioral findings, right? So we went to, towards our multivariate analysis and clustering and fitting. Um, and what we've done is we uh, uh, we clustered the activity in the adult average data, um, and what we uh, across the time window of the N2PC, so it was approximately 180 to 280 milliseconds of stimulus, and we found that four maps, so maps are just stable EEG um, topographic patterns, explain this activity well in that particular time period, and then we fit it back into um, single subject data, and what we found. We found that indeed there was a, a stable pattern that was predominating in that time period, and it modulated with the um, color of the distractor, showing that there was there was a brain network that was responsible for um, for instantiating visual selective attention. But now we have also found another pattern here called the MAP2, which has been, which was sensitive to the um, nature of the distracted, meaning that it reflected the sensitivity of the brain to, um, to, to paying attention to visual versus audiovisual distractors. What about younger participants? So seven-year-olds, what we found is it was that the, the map that was predominating in adults was also predominating on them, but it was not yet modulating with the color of the distractor or with the uh, with the presence of the sounds with the distractors. And for five-year-olds, this map was also present reliably, but what was um, not found in them is that this map was predominating against um, other um, uh, EEG patterns during this time period. All right, so to quickly summarize, for adult-like mechanisms, what we found is about behaviorally and magnitude, adult-like top-down feature-based, so color-based visual selective attention is already developed after uh, when children are seven years old, so after two years of schooling, sorry, um, but multisensory enhancement of visual attention seems to develop at least after nine years of age. Then adult-like distractor, elicit the N2PC, measured traditionally, seems to be absent in our group of five to nine-year-olds, despite the fact that uh, some of those uh, children did show visual selective attention behaviorally. But our multivariate analysis have uh, demonstrated adult like spatially selective EEG patterns um, governing the N2PC already in five year olds. For visual selective attention, it was already predominating at seven years. For multisensory selective attention, it was present but immature and it will only get mature later on. I'm not showing these results here. Right. But we were also interested in, in mechanisms that were more specific to the age of our participants. So instead of clustering using uh, adults as, as the subjects where we would identify the, the EEG stable patterns, um, we would uh, cluster the patterns within each age group um, separately. 
And what we found here, for seven-year-olds, we have now found a map that was uh, modulating with the color um, of the destructor, showing um, that now, uh, for the first time, that um, children um, are showing brain networks that are sensitive to visual selective attention. But also, the remaining four EG stable patterns that were present in the um, N2PC time window actually were also sensitive to the nature of the destructor, reflecting um, a brain base for multisensory selective attention. For five-year-olds, we found that three of the maps were sensitive to the color of the destructor, um, and uh, while well, none actually were modulating with uh, multisensory uh, nature of the destructors. And what we did next is we correlated the duration of those maps within each age with the results of um, uh, specific age groups in the standardized tests of literacy and numeracy. So for seven-year-olds, what we found is that uh, one of the multisensory ERP patterns um, uh, in its duration was associated with the scores on the literacy uh, on literacy tests, and another pattern that was uh, associated with visual uh, visual selective attention was associated with the uh, sorry was correlated um, with the score on the numeracy tests. For five-year-olds, um, we found one of the visual patterns was related in its duration with the score on the standardized numeracy test. And so to summarize, now the ERP results, when we focus on the age-specific mechanisms, are more, were more consistent with behavior. So seven-year-olds now showed ERP patterns that modulated with selective attention, but also with multisensory attention. But they also, uh, our analysis here revealed sensitivity to processes that were not visible in behavioral measures. So five-year-olds showed lateralized ERP patterns, like the queuing effects that they have shown, but also sensitivity to visual selective attention, which we haven't seen in the behavioral measures. Only those age-specific ERP patterns correlated with educational scores, and they did so in age-dependent fashion. So for five-year-olds, this was visual selective attention that, uh, uh, that was important to one of the skills, and for seven-year-olds, um, these were both visual and multi-sensory uh, um, uh, attention types that were uh, important for two different skills. Right, so to summarize, attention and learning seem to be different in multisensory context than in visual context. And um, we should not be thinking about children as just more distractful adults, as clearly um, this is not, the story is not as simple as not the case. Right, finally, um, I'll tell you about how uh, technology can support learning. And so now is the time for our poll for. Poll started. All right, so let's close the poll and here are the results. So as expected, um, the second one, less than one hour per day, but only with mom, dad, sibling, has the highest vote, 75%. And the first one, no hours per day, 25%. Is that Bravo. what you were looking uh, for? <laughs> yes, so the majority answered uh, correctly. Um, uh, if, please forgive me, I, some of the answers were a bit tongue-in-cheek, uh, but I also know the, the reality of having kids and trying to provide them with the best um, best conditions to, to grow, but also uh, trying to survive as a parent. <laughs> um, so thank you, you were, you were indeed correct. We can go back to the, to the presentation. Right, so I'll tell you just a little bit about the project that I've been leading for the past uh, couple of years. Um, so uh, we've been running a clinical trial where we want to understand the role of multisensory attention in new, base, uh, new game-based interventions in the pediatric vision disorders by using our measures that we do know that predict how well children recognize reward objects like letters. So 
The project uh, aims are the following. So we want to understand the differences between um, healthy children and those uh, who have a so-called amblyopia. So for those who don't know, amblyopia is a vision impairment where um, the brain learns to ignore the input from um, one of the eyes. And this is driven um, by either the child having misaligned axis of the two eyes, so just having a very large difference in the um, refractive area between the two eyes. And so um, while we think of lazy eye as an as a eye disorder, in fact, it's more of a um, brain disorder, a sensory brain disorder. And so we want to understand to what extent healthy children and adults um, differ in the skills uh, of basic vision and seeing in 3D and, and, and how they process sensory information at early stages. Uh, in the brain, but also how these, um, how those interactions between um, uh, basic vision skills and, and sensory processes affect higher level processes like attention, and which of those levels actually show the largest um, deficits compared uh, between those two um, two groups. The um, second aim is, is the primary aim of the RCT, so uh, or the R or randomized control trial. We want to understand to how um, stereoptic games, which engage both eyes, um, are effective in treating um, amblyopia. And here we're using the main clinical measure, which is the visual acuity, so the sharpness of vision. And finally, bringing it back home, we want to understand, um, based on, on previous literature, we have quite strong um, uh, evidence uh, to believe that the games are going to be effective. I'll tell you about them just in a second more. Um, but we want to see to what extent the different levels, more sensory or more cognitive, are important in supporting the game-based uh, benefits for, for low-level vision. Right, so just a little bit about the project. We will be testing children and adults between 6 to 5-year-olds. Um, they have residual pediatric amblyopia, meaning that after two sessions uh, of therapy with patching, which is the regular treatment for, for those, uh, popula for those um, people, there's no more change. And so regularly around approximately age of 11 to 13, they just go home and they just told to, to wear glasses and they have this residual um, difference between the two eyes. And that's, this is um, generally considered something that is normal, while this actually is, is, uh, is, is inducing quite a lot of problems in, in people's lives, also in terms of well, well-being, uh, but also the, the occupational choices, et cetera. We also test uh, typically developing controls, as I've said. For the amblyopia, we will have those who have uh, strong uh, differences in the refractive error and those who have misaligned eyes. We have test uh, 30 participants in each group. Uh, we're doing this in Geneva. And what about the intervention? So it's a crossover design, meaning that some of the, so the participants will first either play games or have the control treatment. The control treatment is just basically wearing glasses. So the thing that would be um, given to them as a treatment after um, their, the regular patching treatment would have failed for them. They will be playing the games for eight weeks uh, for a total of 20 hours, uh, 30 minutes per day max, and they have eight games to choose from. And the games have been developed by a company in San Francisco Bay that deals specifically with games for, uh, for, for, for this type of disorders. Um, and also they've been co-developed with um, uh, colleagues at the um, University of Geneva and in University um, College Berkeley. So the groups, as I said, is, uh, is um, amblyops who will undergo games and also healthy participants who will also undergo games. And this is just a quick demonstration of, of, of uh, the procedure. So participants will first either have um, games or, or, the regular, or, or the standard care or vice versa. Right, so we'll use um, the games, uh, so the, the company is called Vivid Vision, they're, they're doing great work and we collaborated together to, to try to show very strong evidence also for uh, interventions that are based in home. And the games look the following, so uh, for example you can have, uh, is it, it's in VR, If I sorry if I forgot to mention this, so the two, um, two screens in the VR basically present slightly different screens. And both uh, images in both screens are important for um, for completing the task. Uh, um, the task, for example, here in this game is popping bubbles, and you need to pop the bubble um, that is the closest to you at a given moment. And and so those games um, encourage the use of both eyes, and so the development or redevelopment of um, ability to use both eyes. So it's all stereo stereo vision, and we know that this ability is, is typically absent 
in amblyops. So basically, amblyops do not see in 3D at all. And other games can be a little bit more attention demanding, which we uh, love and adore, obviously. Um, and so you can, for example, steer um, a spaceship that goes through um, uh, through asteroids and you need to be careful because every now and then there will be something popping up. And so it also puts a certain strain on, on the attention. And so there's, I'm showing you the, these two games as the sort of um, two extremes of quite um, low demand and more high additional demand uh, type of a game. All right, to, to, to conclude, hopefully in terms of how technology can support learning in natural psych environments, the sky is the element we will see. Um, in terms of implications for, for, for supporting development and, and learning, if, if, if I was to, to, to make some, I think that multi representations likely co-develop with the unisensory uni representations. Uh, but also on, um, on research, uh, based on research, we know that basic multi-sensory processes can be harnessed to, uh, to help scaffold more complex, higher level cognitive object related processes. We have uh, known, known uh, in terms of using EEG, we have known EEG correlates that can serve as markers of learning related processes. But here, multivariate methods um, increase the sensitivity of those markers and also can reveal brain mechanisms, which obviously is, is very useful. Um, then age is one strong factor that determines sensitivity to audiovisual versus unisensory destruction. And based on this, and as well as other research, um, I would suggest that um, removing uh, auditory and visual distractors from the classroom could support learning, not only for the younger individuals, but also across age groups. And finally, technology like VR, tablets, um, opens new frontiers for supporting brain plasticity, and brain plasticity in of itself should be treated um, holistically, so be probed uh, with, uh, with sensitive, objective measures, um, engaging the brain, uh, using, uh, always uh, creating strong demands for, for both perceptual as well as attentional um, processes. And this is something that um, this level of this online demand, uh, also known as uh, adaptiveness, is, is something that we do know is underlying the successfulness of games as, as engines for brain plasticity. And with this, thank you for your multisensory attention. <laughs>